It's not often you hear of a school student suing the government, but Anjali Sharma made headlines around the world when she did just that. Now the teenager is going head to head with politicians to change the law. It's been a wild ride and it's far from over. Being a young person and doing what you can to put pressure on government and big polluters is no easy task. There is so, so much work and emotional energy required to have those tough conversations and to walk through hallways where people your age usually don't walk through. Anjali is like a lot of teenagers who want the world to be a better place. And I believe those in power do have a duty of care to young people. At the age of 16, I sued the government to protect us from the impacts of climate change. We have stakes in this conversation. This is our future. Anjali's really latched onto that concept that adults should take care of children um, and take care of matters that will affect them in the future. The crazy idea in Parliament this week that governments should have a duty of care to the next generation when deciding legislation. I personally don't think uh, we need a bill or a court ruling to tell me as a legislator that I have a duty of care. Uh, the Australian people tell me that every three years. I really hope that the government will come to the table with a constructive and open mind. It's a lot of responsibility and there's immense expectations that are being placed upon her shoulders. The types of commentary and the types of attacks on her were, were horrible. Look, I don't, I don't want to be aggressive with you, but if you're going to throw that out there... And what, what year are you in, by the way? About 10, 11? I remember feeling incredibly dejected, incredibly um, hopeless. But that being said, it's also incredibly rewarding. And seeing what young people can do when empowered and given even a smidgen of the tools needed to make a difference has been amazing. last three years there's been heaps of moments where I've kind of just wished that I could be a teenager Give me the ball. Give me the ball. who you know focuses on the next exam coming up or the next party yeah. and you know doesn't have that sense of um, overwhelming worry about the world that would be quite nice Catch. good girl I come home to Melbourne every uni break Catch. because I miss my mum and my brother a lot when I'm up in Canberra Anjali and myself, we are very close. And uh, of course, uh, when she decided to go to Canberra, it was not easy. Uh, but I knew that she has some goal for herself. Come here, come on. There can be weeks where it feels like my entire life is just emails and phone calls about the duty of care campaign. What are you doing? Um, just answering some emails. Sometimes I have noticed that she's not able to switch off. So I tell her, you are back, you just turn it off, you know, just relax. Thank you. Seeing what my family in India has gone through for the last few years was what first evoked that sense of injustice and that sense of passion within me to, to make a difference. <laughs> I've been back to India five times since we migrated when I was 10 months old. My family is from a place called Lucknow in India, which is a few hundred kilometers outside of the capital of Delhi. It's got less of the hustle and bustle of the city and more of the community feel. Everyone knows everyone's names. <laughs> There's stray dogs on the street and there's cows, but you know, it's, it's home and that's kind of what home's always been to me. How are you feeling? For first time, six years. Six years? It's been a while. How was the travel? Long, very long. Yeah. All her cousins and her aunties and uncles, I really want them to know what she's doing. How has the campaign gone so far? 
It's turned into a very, very big thing in Australia. Like, all the politicians know about it. It's been in the news a lot. And I think that they do take an interest in it because over the last few years, the impacts of climate change in India have been quite devastating. And my family in particular have most significantly been impacted by heat waves. Now I'm seeing the first time football skills. It's constantly like uh, the temperature will rise to such a extreme. <laughs> it used to be 35, then it's going to 40s. So it, yeah, it's rising and I think we are a midst of a crisis and the people don't know about it. The heat wave that occurred in India in 2022, um, I heard horrific stories of ash fat melting, of birds falling out of the sky, and also rubbish tips um, catching fire. Last two years, many people lost their life because of heat waves, and then flood came, and we saw that you know the tray is going, the uh, electric poles and power lines are just flowing in the water. Looking back on it now, I would have been around 12 or 13 when I first began to draw a link between what I was seeing happen in India and the words climate change. That was something I'd never done up until that point. I remember towards the end of primary school, Anjali started researching uh, more about climate. Scientists believe it's human activity that's driving the temperatures up. I remember watching a video that talked me through why global warming needed to be limited to 1.5 degrees above prehistoric levels and the difference between that and two degrees of warming. The concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will continue to rise. The extent of those impacts shocked me really, really significantly. So she started kind of educating all of us. You leave the room, you turn the light off, you don't leave the tap open when you are brushing your teeth. I like to take credit for radicalizing my mom. Um, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a joke in the family, but I do like to think that a lot of my beliefs have influenced hers. So we all, I think, grew along with Anjali because she really stood up, just leading all of us. And she also became part of youth climate moment, which was just taking off. The youth climate movement really kicked off in Australia uh, towards the end of 2018, when the first school strikes happened. I remember watching initial videos of the school climate strikes and thinking that they were incredibly powerful. In the world of climate change and the climate wars that we've had, Australia was considered to be a bit of a laggard. And then the whole movement of young people really took hold, because it put that focus on, it isn't just about today, it is about the future. But I think everyone remembers the government's response to that initial school strike. What we want is more learning in schools and less activism in schools. Even better, put your fingers on the keyboard and send your local parliamentarian an email, get on with your studies and prepare yourself for future life. Politicians say, oh, well, the kids should be in school. They shouldn't be out in the street protesting. Uh, we sort of all went, well, bugger that. We're going out anyway. Let's show them today that we will not stand by. We will not let our government stand by as our future burns. When I was 14, I'd helped organise the school strikes down in Melbourne and they were massive. There were grandparents, and there were farmers, and there were miners, and there were people from all walks of life supporting our cause. I don't think I've ever felt more powerful as a young person, and I knew that I wanted to dedicate much of my life to that cause. It was such a huge demonstration of public support 
or ambitious climate action. We thought government can't possibly ignore this. Well, there really was a massive turnout, but very few politicians bothered to even address the issue. What does that tell you? It shows you see that our government is prioritising economic profit over our future. Even though we managed to get people onto the streets of Melbourne, 300,000 nationally, none of the actual policy changes that we were advocating for were implemented. There were climate strikes right around the country. Organisers estimate 300,000 joined the protest. Our small team of lawyers were watching the school strike for climate movement and we understood one of their key asks was for no new coal mines. And we were thinking about that as, as lawyers. We were interested to see whether they wanted to bring a case that would challenge the federal minister's possible approval of her coal mine on the basis that she had a duty of care to avoid harming children. And they were looking for young people to participate and engage in that process. I had no second thoughts about jumping on board. Essentially, we were trying to stop the then Environment Minister, Susan Lee, from approving the extension of a coal mine called the Vickery Extension Project, located in the mining region of New South Wales. As the lead litigant, the case was essentially in my name. The case became known as the Sharma versus uh, Minister for the Environment. So she did become, in some ways, the face of the case. I became involved when David Barnden rang me up. The students, being under 18, couldn't represent themselves, and so they had to search around for someone who was over 18. Sister Bridget previously acted as a litigation guardian many, many times, um, but that was in the context of asylum seekers. She really, really believed in the concept of empowering young people. I'm quite passionate about the issue in itself. I used to be a science teacher, so I couldn't help but think I wished I'd had some of these young students in my classes. As soon as we filed the proceedings back in September 2020, there was immediate media interest. We had eight young people and an 86-year-old nun. There'd been no case like this before. The teen green and the nun has a pretty great ring to it as a yeah. title. Yeah, um, have you thought about scripting this into a TV show or even a feature film? <laughs> Oh, that's, that's going a bit far, I think. Oh, the next avenue for change, first protest, then courtroom, then a TV show. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I went to the court for the first day of the hearings and that was one of the first times I've ever been to a court. Being a young person there on a day off from year 11, it was more so intimidating than anything else. Just everyone seemed so tall, everyone seemed so well dressed. And, you know, I was wondering how I'd ended up there and what I was doing. After the first day of court case, Anjali, followed the live stream from my school. Anjali would come into school early and find an empty classroom where she could log on to a, a Zoom call to be able to do a, a podcast to explain what was happening in her case and then would have to turn around 15 minutes later and go and attend an English class. Now, if global warming is all about the science, why do global warming activists keep getting children? to push their wild claims. There was a lot of media criticism. These young people are naive. They're being controlled by the lawyers. They're being controlled by their parents. They're being controlled by the renewable energy companies. I don't know the inner workings of the legal system, so I have relied on the uh, help of lawyers. Nobody's pressuring me to do this. I've got so many other ways I could be spending my time. They are aware of what's going on and what needs to be done and they are standing up for themselves and for other people. The young people, they desperately wanted this uh, case to win, desperately wanted it. As a much, much older person, I couldn't help thinking, oh, I hope they're not too let down. In mid-2021, the judge handed down his decision. I was watching the live stream from my Year 11 economics class, and it was quite surprising. There are features of the relationship between the minister and the children which favour the recognition of a common law duty of care. 
The judge didn't issue an injunction to stop the coal mine because he couldn't be sure the minister would actually breach her duty. However, the judge decided that there was a duty of care that the minister owed to children. And it was the first time that the federal court had considered it and accepted it. A class action by a group of Australian school students has set a legal precedent which experts say could have widespread ramifications for climate change policy. To have a court rule in favour of us felt incredibly validating. It felt like, you know, we'd been fighting for this for years and years through the school strikes. <laughs> it is a historic judgement. So this is an amazing decision. It's the first time in the world that such a duty has been recognised. I didn't agree with the judgement. No final orders have been made. And both I and my department are considering the judgement. Cartoons were made about the trial. We were approached by documentary makers and people wanting to make drama series out of it. And Jali's had her phone ringing non-stop. <laughs> The joy of that court victory lasted about two months before the government announced their intention to argue that they didn't, in fact, owe us a duty of care. The appeal was heard in October of 2021. Yeah, we're going to know any minute. It's quite scary. The federal court has ruled that the environment minister does not have a duty of care to young people when assessing fossil fuel projects. I remember sitting on the floor of the federal court hand in hand with my fellow litigants. And as soon as the court, the judges said that they wouldn't be imposing the duty of care, I remember them completely breaking down into tears. <laughs> The appeal court accepted the minister's argument that it was the domain of parliament to impose or not impose a duty of care. I would say to young people what I have just said, that I take my responsibilities very seriously, my statutory responsibilities in protecting the environment under the Act. So are you guys going to keep fighting? The fight for climate justice never stops, no matter what the federal court hands down. Anjali Sharma, what's your response to today's ruling? Um, I can't lie, I'm absolutely devastated and really, really angry. Yeah, we aren't old enough to vote and it, it devastates me because I feel like... As the lead litigant, she had to defend her position and she had to do it all in the moment, when, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. I'm keeping all the articles of Angeli's work and not all, the, all of them are positive. Yes, this article, the headline already is quite, like, patronising. The schoolgirl um, will strike from her $25,000 a year private school in protest. It draws attention to my school fees, like, to make me out as a very, like, privileged, very spoiled person. And that actually, I think, really hurt her because, I mean, Angela, she's a scholarship student. Um, she couldn't have been here without that. A lot of the criticism I've received over the last few years has been race-based or it's been gender-based or it's been age-based. I got this one once, which was quite funny to me. Are you just an Indian operative working against the interests of Australia? Um, straight out of India, go protest your old government. All this BS, you have no idea. At some point I said, just don't look at these things. Just shut off, you know. Turn the Instagram off. Don't go on Twitter. Um, she was uh, disheartened, devastated, but at the same time, predetermined to fight back. You know, just because the court overturned that ruling, it doesn't mean the duty of care concept had to die then. After the federal court decision, David and I and some of the other lawyers started to discuss the idea of a duty of care bill. That's right, and that's the, precisely what the court suggested. The court had said that they weren't finding necessarily that a duty of care didn't exist, but just that it wasn't the job of the courts to impose it, but rather the job of parliament to legislate it. Yeah, there's a, a wealth of information in, in the case on, on how such a duty of care could work. The thing about Ange is that she didn't let it fizzle out, that she kept going and she said, I really want to make this happen. Anjali moved to Canberra in uh, 2023, beginning of 2023. Oh, yeah. Definitely being in this duty of care case has 
created a big impact in that decision that she wanted to pursue law. It was a perfect place for me, not just to study law and arts, but also to continue and to build this campaign. So not science, guys. <laughs> I built up this body of research, which I then began to take to politicians to ask them to hear me out and to take on the bill. And got in touch about the duty of care. We then started to work out, well, how, how could you actually do this in law? I'm here today standing alongside Senator Pocock as we table this bill in Parliament to implement a statutory duty of care. The bill would establish that when the government is looking at approving or funding new fossil fuel developments, that they are required to consider the health and well-being of young people as a paramount consideration in that process. Too many of the decisions we make in this place do not factor in the futures of young people and future Australians. So I was thinking maybe we could frame it as like a little panel about intergenerational equality and we could be there as a climate perspective. After the bill was launched, the campaign was gaining traction. So we started to put together a bit of a team that would be the inner machinery of the campaign. Everything we do, I feel like, is a massive long shot. People like me, interested in advocacy, interested in politics. What was that figure that you were saying? When I became aware of the campaign, I sort of immediately jumped on board. Not too many stats, because then the numbers will get mixed up in people's heads. Yeah. None of us have ever participated in parliamentary legislation drafting before, and none of us have ever had to run a grassroots campaign out of our uni dorms, and it's it's a massive learning curve. Oh, well, let's actually check where the EDM is at. We thought, what a great opportunity to have a bunch of young people come to Parliament and to talk about the duty of care bill with their local representative. Hi, I'm Ange. And I'm Jess. And it is 7am and we are currently on our way to Parliament. It's going to be a massive day and we're so excited. Um, come on, guys, and see how it goes. That's a bunch of you, my friends. <laughs> and you guys are meeting with an independent? Yes. As your first meeting to make a We've only been here once on a school excursion and it's all like we never came here to actually discuss something. In my yeah. notebook I have like a million books. It feels like the government is so far away from you um, and today we've actually got that opportunity to just come here and actually express ourselves. It was a 12 hour day and it was full of meetings. I think we had 35 that day. Hello. Come in. Hello. Hey. 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 Lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you as well. And hello. I think it was really confronting for a lot of politicians to have young people as young as 12 come and sit on their couches and talk about their fears in relation to climate change. I am a super, I'm like, I'm a super future focused person mm -hmm. and I hate feeling out of control. I think it's a really, I'm very, very supportive. We got lots and lots of advice from the independents and the crossbench in particular. You know, trying to get through legislation is you don't always necessarily get everything you want. I think we went into the meetings knowing that it's kind of their full-time job to negotiate and to bring the government on side, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, it's nice to see yeah, you. Yeah, lovely to see you again. For this bill to pass, we need a really productive, really constructive working relationship with the government. Um, what would be a really good place to say is well, why do you care about it and why do you think it's important? We've been in several meetings today where we've been like looked at by government MPs and we've been told, oh, but we have this target and we have this amendment and we have this legislation. There is still no policy that takes into account our interests, our health and our well-being. We offered up this bill as another tool in their belt to achieve their targets and to complement their policies. The current Commonwealth Government was elected on the basis of 82% renewable energy by 2030. As of the middle of last year, we're up to about 35% renewable energy in our electricity grid. We're not going fast enough yet, but it's not simple. We're here for one reason like everybody is here today, and that's to pull a halt to this reckless renewable race. Yeah, look, we, we all have concern about how do we reduce our emissions? How do we look after our environment? That's the only thing at contention here, is about how we achieve it and who bears the burden of it. I care about our children's future, and this is not the way to go. My constituents are very concerned about the pace 
and the consultation in which uh, the government has undertaken this because they are recklessly trying to do this by 2030. The wind turbines around us that they're planning that are going to tower over our homes are one and a half times the, Sid the size of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Have you got that mental picture? We'll have a look at the bill, uh, but we should pause, we should plan and get this right. We've got time. Uh, and we should put all the options on the table. How can we delay this even further? Climate scientists are telling us we can't, but we have this really narrow window to act. And the duty of care is about forcing politicians to actually do that and to be expanding the fossil fuel industry in 2023, 2024 is total madness. Uh, good morning. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. So we're in Parliament House today and the Senate is holding a full day um, inquiry into the duty of care bill. We hope that we don't come out of this process without a duty of care because it's been put in the too hard basket. You know, we protect our children from smoking. We protect our children from gambling, from alcohol. To not consider the climate change impacts on children is an omission. But is this the right manner? Is this the bill that will give you the outcome that you seek? I'm a Liberal. I'm for smaller government. This is absolutely insane and offensive to me that we're going to legislate a thought process as we put policy in place. A lot of us parents, we all do consider the future. It's very rare for private centres bills to pass. And so ultimately this will come down to Australians saying to their local representative, this is something I want and I'm going to continue to, to push. And Ange and hundreds of thousands of young people across the country are part of that. It was initially quite intimidating to be looking senators in the eye and really fully advocating for this bill. Um, ultimately, um, 50 years down the track, we are the ones who will be making decisions for the world. We are the ones who will be um, living out our lives in a, a world shaped by the impacts of the decisions made today. I think right now I'm just feeling a lot of adrenaline and a lot of exhilaration. Um, I think I'll go home tonight and absolutely crash and reflect on the last four years and just how draining truly the process has been. Hi, thanks so much. Um, just to the Australian National University. Yes. Thank you. Sometimes I feel she's taking too much on herself. So we do have arguments on that sometimes, like a typical 19-year-old being rebellious. But I know that that's her passion. And is a, a young woman who's put much on the line for what she believes in. So I will watch, as long as I'm alive, <laughs> I will watch uh, her future with interest. We don't have time for baby steps anymore. So I'm not going to stop campaigning for radical change because I think that that's the only way to, to safeguard the rights of young people in the face of climate change. <laughs>